When Christine Quinn was elected city council speaker in 2006, New Yorkers had every reason to be proud. But what happens when you discover that her commitment to integrity and passion for our community turn out to be just as fake as her smile? It was September 2007, and I had just finished shooting a documentary called Blinders about the movement to ban horse-drawn carriages from New York City when a spooked carriage horse crashed into a tree and died on Central Park South. After this accident, a New York City Council member introduced a bill at City Hall to ban horse-drawn carriages from the streets of New York. A few City Council members told me, discreetly, that even though they support a ban and were getting hundreds of letters from constituents, they couldn't sign on to the bill for fear of angering City Council Speaker Christine Quinn. Quinn is protecting the carriage operators because they have close ties to the Queen's Democratic machine, whose support she wants if she runs for mayor. So here we have thousands of New Yorkers asking their elected officials to support the ban, the ASPCA stating that carriages cannot be operated humanely or safely, and cities like London, Paris, and Beijing that have taken horse and buggies off the streets. But because it's in the political best interests of one person to protect the industry, the bill is dead on arrival. Is this the democracy in action and transparent government that Quinn is always talking about? I didn't understand how one person could wield so much power and why city council members couldn't vote the way they wanted. And then the slush fund scandal broke in April 2008 when the public learned that Christine Quinn had, at her disposal, millions of dollars in slush funds allocated to fictitious organizations and she had the sole power to dole these funds out to city council members in exchange for political favors. And did you use any of this money to uh, reward council members or for favors or to for any of these reasons? No, these monies were, were, were largely used to fix errors and for mid-year budget needs and requests. Of course she used this money in exchange for political favors. And she finally confessed to it in an article in New York Magazine where she said, did I think a speaker having the reserve money to give out through the year might give me political leverage? Of course I did. I'm not going to lie to people that I didn't think that. Really? Because you lied about it at the press conference. Here's another slush fund related lie. I found out about that in the late fall, early winter of 2007. And the moment we found out about it, we turned it over to investigators. How could you not have known about these funds until late 2007 if you had sole discretion over these funds in 2006 and 2007? And if 24% of the funds went to groups in your own district in 2007? I think these questions have been asked and answered over and over again. Of course she didn't answer that question, and she never has. After the scandal broke, Quinn hired a $600 an hour criminal defense lawyer, compliments of New York City taxpayers, because the New York City Department of Investigation and the U.S. Attorney's Office began investigating Quinn slush funds. We are cooperating with the U.S. Attorney. We are cooperating with the Department of Investigation. There have been no subpoenas to date. Because Quinn is gay, and so am I, I decided to reach out to several leaders in the gay community to see how they felt about the slush fund scandal. To my surprise, they said what they were really angry about is the number of ways in which Christine Quinn has betrayed the gay community behind the scenes since becoming speaker. On October 28, 2008, a 52-year-old gay man named Robert Pinter was buying a DVD in an adult video store in the East Village when an attractive 29-year-old man, who turned out to be an undercover police officer, flirted with him. Shortly before exiting the store, he suddenly said to me that he wanted to pay me $50 to uh, perform uh, oral sex on me. Uh, at first, I thought he wanted me to pay him. It would have made a lot more sense since he was about half my age. Robert didn't accept the money, but as he stepped into the street, a group of police officers pushed him against the wall, arrested him for prostitution, and threw him in jail. Over 50 gay men both locals and tourists, were framed and falsely arrested for prostitution. Rosie Mendez, a council member for the East Village, was outraged. Going into pawn shops and profiling gay men, middle-aged gay men, and then arresting them for prostitution. Shit! Even Tom Duane, who is a state senator, condemned the arrests. But Christine Quinn, who had at least 22 men in her Chelsea district who were falsely arrested, refused to help for months. 
Why? Activists say that, politically, she's better off ignoring the gay community, whose unconditional support she knows she can take for granted, than she is criticizing the NYPD for the false arrests. As the arrests continued, the victims banded together in a group called the Coalition to Stop the False Arrests and threatened to hold a protest at the mayor's house, a move that would embarrass Quinn politically. So several months after the arrest started, she called a meeting with gay rights leaders and representatives from the NYPD and mayor's office. Not only did she skip the meeting, she instructed one of her staffers to pressure Robert Pinter into canceling the protest. The purpose of this meeting was to silence these victims, not to help them. In fact, eight months after being thrown in jail for prostitution, Robert Pinter is still fighting the city to reverse the charges against him. In a bit of irony, these illegal attacks on the gay community were taking place just as Christine Quinn was planning to roll out an international ad campaign to lure gay tourists to New York City. At the press conference, she said, 40 years ago, a group of people said, enough was enough, and they struck back against police officers. Christine, the NYPD has been attacking gay men in your district under your watch. Knowing what the police were doing, how could you possibly invite other gay people to New York and put them at risk? Some gay activists say that Quinn's failure to stop the false arrests pales in comparison to the backroom deal she struck with the NYPD in 2007 to curb New Yorkers' freedom of assembly. Instead of conducting public hearings, Christine Quinn rubber-stamped a rule that would prohibit groups of 50 people or more from assembling in public without a permit. How could Christine Quinn take away our constitutional right to freedom of assembly, the very civil right that put her into power, and the very civil right that enabled gay people to fight back during Stonewall? Christine Quinn, get for a drink. Your policies are full of Christine Quinn. In October 2008, Christine Quinn reversed her position on term limits, a decision that triggered an assault on the democratic process that will go down in history. Here's what she used to say about term limits. They are the will of the voters and we must abide by them and we cannot be distracted by attempts to change them. But on October 13th, 2008, she stepped up to the microphones and reversed her position. In these difficult times, I believe voters should have the choice to keep the current leadership of our city. So why would a public figure who spoke so fervently about term limits change her mind, especially after New Yorkers voted twice to keep term limits? First, the slush fund scandal that broke a few months before virtually crippled her chances of being elected mayor in 2009. But four years from now, most voters will have forgotten about the slush fund scandal. Secondly, if Quinn supported Mayor Bloomberg in his quest for a third term, then he would undoubtedly support her mayoral candidacy in 2013. Finally, some City Hall insiders speculate that, in exchange for Quinn's support of the mayor's third term, Bloomberg would put the brakes on the New York City Department of Investigation's probe into Quinn's slush fund scandal. Political circles have been buzzing about how the mayor got Quinn to sign on to his legislation. There's certainly no backroom deal here. I get quest 20 questions a day about it. I don't know how you can call that a backroom deal. Then what happened to the city's investigation into the slush funds? More than a year has gone by, and the Department of Investigation has been silent. In addition to betraying both voters and the democratic process in New York City, Quinn betrayed the gay community when she reversed her position on term limits because other LGBT candidates who were planning to run for what should have been vacant city council seats dropped out of the race. It would have been nice to have better representation because since Christine Quinn became speaker, not one LGBT bill has been introduced at City Hall. The irony is that the gay community thinks that Christine Quinn is our hero. She swoops into gay charity events and public rallies, speaks passionately about gay civil rights, and gives everyone the impression that she's fighting for us at City Hall, when, behind our backs, she betrays us and sells us down the river when politically expedient. In the past, I had nothing but respect and admiration for Christine Quinn, but now that I know about the deceptions and betrayals, I feel it is important to help others see the truth behind the smile.